We'd like to welcome you to this lecture. I am your host, uh, Asarim Hotep. Um, today's topic is called A Linguistic View of Spirit, Taking the Spookism Out of African Spirituality. Uh, brought to you by the Madhu Indela Institute for the Advancement of Culture and Science. And again, our focus is A Linguistic View of Spirit, uh, subtopic taking the spookism out of African spirituality before I get started I like to give praise and honor to five wonderful African African American ancestors who have uh, paved the way for us in this modern age and who have influenced not only my scholarship but my approach to life and activism as a whole and so to put a name to those who may not be familiar with these particular faces on the top left hand corner we have the Honorable uh, Marcus Garvey at the bottom we have the late Dr. Shekanti Jope on the bottom right hand corner we have Paul Robinson on the top we have Brother Malcolm X and in the center we have the great Harriet Tubman. If you are unfamiliar with uh, these individuals, I highly encourage you to look them up and to know their stories. Uh, these are great examples to emulate and in their honor I pour digital libations. I say I say to your memory and may your spirit uh, cloak over and guide this discussion. I say. Uh, this is my re orientation map, uh, just to kind of give us a visual of the kind of focus that we'll have uh, throughout this discussion, and that is um, a proper African-centered paradigm, which means that the dialogue of as it regards the topic in regards to spirit will be coming from African sources primarily, and so we want to understand how the Africans understood the concept of spirit and how that manifested in their everyday lives and what and not only that but what we can also take home from a re of spirituality from the African perspective and so um, this is going to be kind of general discussion um, but at the same time it's going to um, introduce to some um, or to many various different linguistic concepts as we're going to look at the concept of spirit from a linguistic standpoint first and then explore the living traditions to see how that is manifested. Uh, we go through the language because the language houses the psychology uh, and motivations of the culture and so uh, all of the the culture is encapsulated in the language so if we really want to understand the crux of African spirituality uh, it is my argument that we must understand spirit from a linguistic standpoint first and then uh, ex use that as a foundation by which to examine the the cultural manifestation or expression of these ideals so this particular slide and map is just to kind of give us a visual of what that means uh, coming from an African perspective. And so the focus of our discussion is uh, again a linguistic view of spirit uh, and taking the spookism out of African spirituality. In many of my discussions we come across a lot of interjection of this word spookism in uh, the dialogues and so I wanted to get a grasp of this and to see if spookism really you know fits within the model in which the ancient Africans uh, developed in terms of spirituality and so if there is any spookism in the modern interpretation of African spiritual traditions to strip it from it and to get to the core and, and real essence of African spirituality so that we have a uh, a more accurate uh, assessment of African spirituality and we can move forward with the most uh, honest and again accurate information so that we can uh, correctly 
included or embedded or integrated into our lives in modern times. And so uh, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary.com defines spookism as the belief or in or the practice of communicating with spooks or spirits, especially spiritualism, uh, a dabbler in wireless and has a specially equipped set which collects the voices of the dead. Uh, Sydney, Australia. Um, it is the essence of spirit and spirituality that uh, again is our focus and so um, it, it appears here by the definition of the dictionary that you know the the spook itself has to deal with spirits and so um, we'll, we'll move a little further and so into this discussion so the next slide uh, coming from the etymological dictionary online um, or the online etymological dictionary uh, gets more specific in terms of the etymology of spook and so <laughs> As we can see here, it is a specter or apparition or a ghost. And so um, when we talk about spookism in the modern context, more than likely people are considering the, the concept of a, a ghost or like a white, you know, um, bodiless, you know, uh, entity that is going around spooking or scaring someone. And so, as we can see here, that its ultimate root possibly comes to from to shine or to spark. And so, to spook possibly, um, which I would probably argue is coming from the concept maybe of like lightning sparks or flashes and thunderstorms and how that would scare people. And so, they would spook you. And so, that, that kind of transferred on into uh, the concept of spirit in the spirit world. So, uh, that, that, you know, is possibly where this uh, particular concept comes from. So when we're talking about spookism, we're talking about, you know, ghosts and spirits that are meant to harm or scare uh, folks. And so with anything, with any ism, you know, the ism is a linguistic suffix forming nouns of action, state, condition, doctrine. Uh, from the French, isme, or directly from Latin, isma, ismus, from Greek, Isma from a stem of verbs in isin, used as an independent word chiefly disparagingly from 1670s. Um, so it just means the action of state condition or doctrine of. And so, uh, so when we talk about spookism, you know, it is primarily used in the modern context in either the state of being spooked or a doctrine of spooks. And so when, when a lot of folks refer to African spirituality, and they try to interject the concept of spookism, what they're trying to argue is that it is basically a doctrine or a religion of, of spooky spirits um, and that we should turn away from it uh, because of this so-called um, attribute of the tradition. And so in the, uh, the case of the Nation of Islam, you always hear them talk about spookism. And, you know, in general what I say here is in a nutshell that spookism is believing in and teaching the existence of a spirit God the belief is supposed to be belief in God that's not real not human not a flesh and blood not man and so you got to understand from the uh, nation of Islam perspective that spookism or excuse me that God itself is not a a spirit or a spook or a ghost or a flash uh, but it is an actual human being, a human person or human entity. And so um, just wanted to bring some clarity or some context for how they are using the concept of spookism uh, since they, you know, are also involved in a lot of these dialogues as well. So <laughs> the etymology of spirit is going to become uh, very critical in terms of really understanding what is going on with the uh, concept of spirit and so I want to um, put over here I'm sorry move this out of the way uh, yeah, I probably can't even see the little bar but uh, the etymology of the word spirit as far as spirit in the English comes from um, a breathing a respiration um, which 
comes later on to mean an animating or vital principle in man and animals. And so that's what usually the breath uh, means uh, for, uh, it's an animating energy. Without it, one does not live, at least for, you know, living beings. And so the spirit is associated with breath. And, you know, later on is uh, the principle of life itself, uh, the disposition, character, or high spirit, vigor, or courage, pride, or arrogance. Um, and you can see, and this is also coming from um, the online etymological dictionary for those who need the reference. Um, and so, again, this is just in summary, when we're talking about spirit, we're talking about an animating force, we're talking about breath, breathe, we're talking about the wind to blow, life, uh, and then the disposition, character, high spirit, vigor, courage, pride, and, and arrogance. So it has this range of meaning, it's poly... Uh, valiant at this particular time in history, uh, but it initially comes from a concept of breathing and wind. And this is going to be very critical because the African words for spirit are, are also connected to this concept, but it's going to take a different twist than what is has survived in the uh, Indo-European languages. And so there's a particular text that uh, I recommend for those who do not have it, it's called The Way of the Elders by Adama and Niami Diombi, Diombia, uh, Ph.D. Uh, and um, there's a particular proverb that is written in the text uh, that says, Wherever there is sky, there is spirit. And so we get an understanding from this proverb that spirit is all around us. Because as the sky, it covers us. It, it cloaks us. And so wherever there is sky, which seems to be infinite, there is the concept of spirit. And so, um, the, for those who are unfamiliar with this text, they deal with a lot of West African conceptualizations of spirit and spirituality. So this is primarily, you know, from uh, Nigeria area going all the way down to Senegal, in which, uh, the areas in which they cover here. But these equally apply to, you know, Africa in general. So, um, we will see, <coughs> excuse me, in this particular text that uh, on page four, the, the authors inform us that every spirit belongs to spirit. Some of our spirits lived as human beings. Others are forces of nature. They respond to our petitions, though they are also operate from their own agendas. If we are unaware of any spirits, they are better able to exercise their own will and roam about freely. The focus of our lives is how effectively to interact with the world of spirit. Now, someone had asked a question earlier about does spirit have its own consciousness? So at least according to this text and their research, uh, for many of the West African traditions, the spirits itself do have a consciousness. Now, what I would add, or the, the question I would add, is really do the spirits have free will? And so that's something that we may uh, touch on as we, you know, go further into our uh, discussion. But um, again, for for this particular these particular authors, you know, these are living entities. They are conscious uh, or have some level of consciousness, and they respond to human, uh, you know, interactions uh, with them. You know, and so. This is the kind of sense that we get, you know, from an African perspective of what spirit is. So it's not just simply the breath, uh, but these are they, these are an energy force that is conscious of itself. And so uh, within that consciousness is uh, the the force, and so they separate the kind of the the concept of spirit from the force that animates spirit or which spirit is attached to, and they call it inyama. And so they say that inyama is the energy that emanates from spirit and flows throughout the universe. It is the life force that links all of existence together, humans, animals, plants, and minerals. The power of creation and destruction, inyama commands everything from bountiful harvest to droughts and plagues. It directs the twinkling stars and the rippling tides. This energy of the universe shapes nature into its many forms and yields to our handling of its power. Page 5. And so there's, there's an energy force uh, in, in many areas around the continent of Africa. The, the force itself and the, the concept of spirit are one and the same. And we'll see that, you know, there really are kind of different 
you know aspects of the same concept but with some fundamental difference but we'll get into that a little later and so another text that gives us an African perspective of what spirit is is written by a, an, an elder woman by the name of Sabon Fusome um, from the Dagara uh, who is ethnically part of the Dagara people of Burkina Faso she has written a text called The Spirit of Intimacy Ancient African Teachings of the Ways of Relationships and in her text she gives a really excellent uh, articulation of what spirit is uh, at least from the perspective of the Dagara people which coincides with what we find in uh, the previous text in which we just examined and so when indigenous people talk about spirit they are basically referring to the life force in everything for instance you might refer to the spirit in an animal that is the life force in that animal which can help us accomplish our life purpose and maintain our connection to the spirit world the spirit of a human being is the same way. In our tradition, each of us is seen as spirit who has taken the form of a human in order to carry out a purpose. Spirit is the energy that helps us connect, that helps us see beyond our racially limited parameters, and also helps us in ritual and connecting with the ancestors. Ancestors are also referred to as spirits. And so, again, remember our proverb from a few slides back, that everywhere there is sky, there is spirit. And so we understand that in Yama is an energy that emanates from spirit is present in all things. And so this goes into further clarity and lets us know that at least from the indigenous perspective that human beings are spirit in in material form. And so we had a spiritual origins and you know now we're living out a type of existence as a human being. So we are spirit having a human experience, um, according to these particular texts. And I find this to be uh, relatively true across the continent of Africa. And this is the, the primary consensus um, based on my studies. <laughs> and so now that we kind of have that, you know, understanding of what spirit is in terms of breath, in terms of the life force, in terms of human beings being originally spirit uh, having a human experience uh, or it, or now or basically spirits in, in, in the flesh form we ask the question now well when the Africans talk about spirit in their language what do they mean what do what what can the African languages tell us about spirit and so that is just the cultural what we read before it is just the cultural understanding of, of, of spirit and how they use it in their everyday lives or how they understand it in their everyday lives but now we're going to go into a more critical analysis of these concepts of spirits and to see you know how the shared languages you know view spirit and to see if there is a collective theme you know regardless of the relative words for spirit in these different African uh, localities in which we'll be dealing with throughout this discourse. So with that said, uh, I would like to introduce to some a Mr. Jean-Claude Mboli. He wrote a text in 2010. It may have been re released officially in 2011, uh, but it's called The Origins of African Languages, uh, translating from the French. Uh, this text is actually written in French, and what he has done is reconstructed, used uh, historical comparative linguistics to reconstruct a language family that is called by the French speakers uh, Negro African or uh, Negro Egyptian. And so uh, this Negro Egyptian language uh, has many you know stages and steps and has spread out across the continent of Africa in many different localities. And so because these language groups uh, originate from the same proto-source, you will see the same conceptualizations in all of these different areas uh, because they share fundamentally dialects of the same proto-language. And so <laughs> this is his reconstruction of the, the different branches of the Negro-Egyptian 
and um, I won't go into detail here uh, this will require uh, its own lecture um, but this is just to give you a visual of his reconstruction of these uh, these languages and so how on the left hand side what you see here is kind of a, an early branching off from Negro Egyptian archaic branch one and branch two um, they meet up in, in history they begin to share features um, and then they develop into different dialects and these dialects then be develop into different languages which we can see a few of them at the bottom here so the Hausa language, the Zande, the Middle Egyptian the Coptic, the Shango and the Somali languages all re ultimately related languages but different dialects of the Negro Egyptian uh, language phylum and so this is for those who are familiar with um, linguistics they will notice that this is going to be drastically different than the Greensburgian uh, tree of languages in Africa which argues that there's four fundamental families and that is Afroasiatic, Niger Congo, Nilo Saharan and uh, Khoisan and so again the, the discussion of this aspect is beyond the scope of our discussion but it's just here as a reference uh, for those who, you know, one, can read French, and two, you know, would want to look at this a little bit more closely. And so um, here's just another, you know, variation of uh, the, the dialects that happened from the Negro Egyptian post classic. Uh, the Bere branch and the Be'er branch is, again, we have Middle Egyptian and Hausa, Zande and Mande. And we have basically the Gabaya and pre Proto Bantu and Proto Bantu, and basically Bantu. Ultimately, uh, Middle Egyptian and Bantu come from the same source. Uh, Dr. Mube Bige Bololo also uh, verifies this. And then on the other branch of the Negro Egyptian, you have the newer Wolof. Wolof is a language that Sheikh Antijob spoke. And, you know, he did his own reconstruction with ancient Egyptian and also said that it is closely, more re closely related to Coptic. Uh, this actually kind of this whole text actually verifies what Diop uh, had proposed in his um, his earlier works and his reconstructions as because Coptic and Wolof are of the same branch. Uh, excuse me, of, of the, they had the same proto language, um, but ultimately two different dialect, two different branches of uh, the the dialect beer. And so this is just another map from Mboli's work uh, showing the Beer branch and, and where they, you know, migrated over time. And so we see the Luo, the Nair, the Wolof going into West Africa, the Dasango, Somali, Zerma, and Coptic, uh, you know, in the areas of Chad and ancient um, Egypt and Somalia and the Horn. And so this is the other branch we spoke of that was on the left-hand side of the previous, uh, or the two slides back, where the Middle Egyptian, Proto-Bantu, Zande, Hassa, uh, and Bambara languages, you know, ultimately um, had their migrations in time. And so this is important for us because uh, the languages in which we'll examine that have these concepts of spirit you know they're ultimately all related and so we'll see why there's a fundamental similarity between the languages that we examine that are relatable to a lot of these languages which we see in these particular maps and so with that said to this is just a couple of words here for spirit in these different African uh, languages and relatable African languages. Uh, and so we, we see here, for instance, Erhi, which is the spirit double in the Erhorbo language. In Arabic, we have Ria, spirit wind. Hebrew, Rua, Rua, um, spirit wind, temper. Hebrew, Reya, scent. Um, so we can see here that this concept of spirit and wind is relatable to what we saw in. Um, the Indo-European languages uh, from the online etymological dictionary that we saw earlier. The H sound is dropped in the Yoruba languages and so you know instead of saying Rea they say Ori and so it's luck, destiny, Ori, spirit, double and the Lubada, Ori, so-called ghost and Lubada, Ori, Indi which is the soul. 
Um, we see in Swahili, Rojo, spirit, soul, Kikuyu, Rojo, spirit. Um, and then we get into the Bantu, we have Rebo, which is spirit, uh, a variation of this word um, based on the labials. And the labials is your, your B sound and your M nasalized uh, labial. Uh, we see chest, heart, soul, spirit. Um, soul, spirit, all of these different variations that we see here, uh, spirit, soul, and so we get a kind of a range of different associations based on just this one example here of this root. And so for those unfamiliar, uh, the H sound, like the P and the H sounds, uh, often uh, the B, the, the yeah the B, P, and H sounds often interchange uh, because of a process of uh, aspiration and so you know what is left with is for instance what we see down here towards the bottom where it says Rebo um, for spirit it becomes um, you know Rojo or Remo Rumi, Rumo, Rojo and other languages you know Ori which is lost in terms of ghost spirit uh, amongst uh, the Yoruba, Reye you know Rua uh, Ri you know spirit wind and you know Arabic and so um, you know, different vowels have inter uh, introduced themselves throughout the years, and and so for the record, also these little numbers that you see on these Bantu representations is actually from a 1935 book uh, by Reverend uh, W. Wanger, and um, it's uh, comparing the uh, Bantu languages with the ancient Sumerian languages, and so. Um, those are the these are the actual well on this side on the right hand side is the actual page number these are just kind of identifying numbers on the left hand side but the page numbers are on the right so if you have that resource you can see the different languages um, you know and, and references for those and so we'll move on so this is a different you know word for spirit but we see that the same theme is 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 uh, coming through but there's going to be a slightly different um, association with this one and so uh, let's go back and so we see here that the concept of spirit is also with the chest and the heart uh, in, in here these words hong, 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 ohun, hama, 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 hen, hen in the ancient Egyptian and or what now we see spirit but it's also connected to snoring the voice or to roar, to mutter, to shout, you know to shout or cheering soft words, lullaby songs and the thorax and for those who are familiar, the thorax actually controls your breath uh, and, it, and it's and housed in the chest area. It basically is your chest area. And so what they've done is there's a, a semantic shift. So this concept of uh, breath and wind is also associated with the human voice. And so you know you cannot have a voice without breath. And so all of these different things are connected in the African languages. And so in, um, in modern uh, English, for instance, we tend to try to separate all concepts and have different words for them. In the African languages, they are um, pretty much, you know, use the same root, you know, for all of these different concepts. You know, a tone here might change, a vowel here might change, but the same consonant root is used for all of these different concepts. And so uh, it makes it easier to trace these words in the, uh, the African languages but just to give you a little heads up so this is a different word that we saw before but we see that the concept of spirit is still associated with this concept of wind breath but now it's it's um, manifesting itself in the human voice so the human voice is a spirit unto itself and so um, again we're 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 trying to set up a theme here so we're going to have a theme that all of this stuff is going to build on each other so keep these concepts in mind and so amongst the Yoruba have another word for spirit it's called emi which is spirit but they have another variation emi um, and I know I'm doing the tones all wrong um, it's, it's breath and so the Yoruba word me breathe uh, so we can see that spirit breath breathe you know are all in the in, in the same category they all use the same root in the Igbo mumuo spirit in the God language mumo spirit middle Egyptian it's supposed to be like ham uh, to breathe in, in Chiluba, in Yuma, spirit, uh, in, ya, in Yima, soul. And so again, the spirit and the soul are fundamentally the same. And we'll see that again, they all come from 
the, the, the same fundamental root and idea. And so uh, when we saw those RH roots in the, the first slide giving the examples of, of spirits, in, in this one we can see a few of these examples uh, coming from the uh, uh, the reverse, and so we saw the Rebo and Bantu, and then we have another variation of Bada, Bono, Bada, uh, which is name or Billy, you know, chest. And again, you um, we can go to Reverend Wagner's um, book. Uh, the, the official title was Comparative Lexical Study of Sumerian and Intu, uh, which was written in 1935. And so those are the page numbers that you can see these particular. Um, Entities and so in the Shiluba language has a slightly different um, variation. So we say Mvidi, and that's the word for spirit. It, this is a different variation of the word for Bada, Billy, Chess, Bada, uh, and all of those different things. Um, in the Dogon language, these these terms for the Dogon aren't related, but just they're just here to show that there's a correlation between breath, life, and the soul which all use the same roots in these particular languages. So what, what is introduced here is the concept of the name. And the name is going to be very important. So we have a correlation here. Breath, breathing, life, uh, spirit, soul, voice to command, or, uh, and also name and actually to name, as we'll see uh, later on. So all of these conceptualizations are within the same semantic range. And um, again, we're, we're just building here. So I'm showing you different words for, for spirit in the African languages uh, and, and, and the themes that run throughout these different African, um, these, these different African themes. So um, as we can see here, this is actually from uh, Dr. Joy, uh, excuse me, uh, G.J.K. Campbell Dunn. Uh, his work in uh, 2006, who were the Minoans in African answer, and so we see this these these roots that B, um, which becomes F in other languages, which becomes H in others, um, is the the fundamental root in dealing with uh, wind, which also has its other conceptualizations uh, and semantic uh, shifts with it as well. So the concept of wind and blowing also is associated with um, flying and so with birds and things of that nature. So matter of fact, our English word fly comes from the same exact root where the B, um, it was de-voiced to a P and the P became F. And um, the R and L's interchanged in basically all world languages or at least language families. And so uh, what we see here in the bold are these roots um, associated with wind, breeze, blowing, sneezing, um, wings again, paw to fly, uh, which is, uh, which leads us to this concept of towards the bottom amongst the Mangvetu, which is kupapa, which is wing, and on uh, the Congo ipapi, wing, uh, lipapu, wing. Um, all of these in Bantu padad, fly. You know, all of these are crucial, especially for those who uh, understand ancient Egyptian. Uh, in religion, so to speak, because there's an entity or a so-called deity by the name of Kepera, and the deity Kepera is built off of the same root. And so, um, so you would see in uh, the Mangbeto one variation of it, Kupapa. But um, we will see in the next slide uh, this concept of the divine um, in ancient Egypt at the top you can see is Kepper as the divine breath in, um, in Chiluba. And so in Chiluba we would say Kepper as Chipepu or Chipepwila, uh, which is also Kuku Pepa or Pepula, which means to blow or being carried by the wind. Um, the other variations, Pupa, Peeps, um, or it could be Peeps, um, I'm not sure. Uh, Pepula, Pepuila, which means blown, or Chipepula means strong wind, breath bearer of Ra. There's a variation in the ancient Egyptian language, which is just given by Pepe, uh, which is unknown, but they understand it as used about movement. And so um, this, this, this fundamental uh, root has to deal with movement. And so the, this concept of movement is associated with blowing wind and, of course, spirit. And so um, remember earlier that the spirit is associated with an animating force. An animating force is that which compels something to move. 
And so this is the, you see these particular roots here. And so that's fundamentally what you get when you're talking about Kepera. Because Kepera is the, the god of transformation uh, and movement. And so we'll see a representation here of uh, an emblem for the god Kepera. And it's represented by the dung beetle. And we see a, a pair of wings here on the side. And, and usually in the depictions you'll see Kepera, the god Kepera, carrying the sun. And so again, you know, Chipepu, Chipepula, uh, Pepula, blown, being carried by the wind. And so, or being carried by the spirit, being carried by the force of uh, the Inyama, uh, or the Ashe, as we would say in the Yoruba, you know, um, uh, across the world. So this is the fundamental, this is the, the root, this is the, the physical symbol, uh, you know, of this uh, intellectual uh, concept that we see here. And so, again, spirit is that animating force that manifests itself as wind uh, or the voice of something um, and also, you know, which is also the soul of something, which is also the name that we saw earlier. And <coughs> this is this is important here. Um, as we say here that uh, a name is the soul of a person. The word for name is connected with the word for breath, wind and speech. Again, for people who were in oral traditions, you know, the the concept of a name wasn't chosen arbitrarily. It was a it is the 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 configuration, you know, of the spirit. And so all all a name is is something that is vocalized, is the is the vocalization of the spirit of the person. And so when you call someone's name, you're calling the core of that person. And so um, this is fundamentally what we see here. And we'll be able to demonstrate this a little bit more sharply with the ancient Egyptian language. And so the, the remember, we, we connected the concept of the soul and spirit. They're basically the same. And so there, it's also the same in the ancient Egyptian language for this particular word here. Many Egyptologists render this word ka, uh, but it's not really ka, that this little you know, number three looking symbol is really a uh, nasalized uvular trio, which means it's more so like a nasalized R, um, and which, you know, became, becomes an L in other uh, attestations. And so <laughs> we see here that um, this, this other symbol here, this with the arms raised. And so this is the, the metanetra symbol for the ka, so-called ka, which is the uh, the soul and the spirit, the essence of being or personality of a person. In the, um, the Allen Gardner sign is D28. And so um, the ancient Egyptians didn't write out their vowels, so we, we, don't, we aren't particularly sure as to what vowels were in between or after or before these words. But um, so we are left with just the consonant root, the, the Hebrew, uh, and I think the Arabic also did this. And so, you know, so the, the real root of this so-called ka is really a ker, a kel, you know, type particular sound. And we can demonstrate this when we examine other African languages that have this word. And so, um, this is just a linguistic, you know, demonstration of the relationship between uh, this particular sign here and the R. And so this is taken from Dr. Alan Anselin, who is a linguist and archaeologist uh, of Egyptology out of the Caribbean. Um, he wrote a particular article called Some Notes about the early African pool of cultures from which emerged the Egyptian civilization. And so um, these are some of his examples. You can go by and you come back and pause it, and you can see the demonstrations of the same words uh, in the Egyptian for to know and to understand uh, for instance, which we would say sia, or uh, which it should be like a sir, and so we see sir to know um, in, for instance, the Udlam language or the Meri language, sir to know, um, and we see it's not ma at the bottom but a ml sound, which means to see or to look or to examine and so we see in these, I have these bolded for you, um, like for Kimnit male to examine, observe in the Oromo language, which is Eastern Cushitic uh, mild to think, and so on. And so we can see these correlations, um, and there's other examples actually given in the text, and we'll examine one more uh, from this actual slide that I'm going to actually reserve for another slide, which is going to be very important. And so when we talk about the so-called ka, 
which is the soul, the spirit, uh, the essence or personality of a person, uh, this word exists in other African languages. And so amongst the Akan in West Africa, you know, they call it Okra, which is the soul. And amongst the Gaz, the Kla, soul. In the Belin, the Cushitic language is Inkera, soul, life. Amongst the Kwara, which is another Cushitic group, is Inkera, uh, soul, life. Uh, the Tayo, the Niger Congo is Inkira, which is spirit. This this actual word was palatalized and became the word Necher. Um, you know, when talking about the spirit or soul of the uh, the, the ancient Egyptian, so it's a, a, what we call a doublet in the ancient Egyptian language. Uh, but that's beyond our scope here, so we'll just continue. And so, again, when we correlated the soul and the spirit, remember that in the other in the other languages, there was also a correlation between the, the soul, spirit, and to name or voice. And so we see these same um, correlations here. So that same ka is also for a word meaning to say or to speak something. And so we see in the Hebrew, Arabic, Hasa, the Chiluba, Evo, Tui um, languages, these the same root and it's many manifestations all dealing with um, being able to call or to talk, speak, utter, the voice, sound, or to declare, to call for someone, um, and even, you know, manifesting as thunder, you know, from the sky. And so this is actually where we get the word call from in, in our English language. And so every time you call someone on the phone, you're, you're saying a, a dialectical variation of the ancient Egyptian word, uh, it could be kel or kelu, kera, uh, meaning to say, um, or kero, call in the Hebrew language. Um, for instance, it would be makulu, and um, in terms of language, in the Chiluba language, akulu, which means to talk, speak, utter, express, um, or whatnot. So we can see the same correlation linguistically between the name and the soul. And so, uh, excuse me, the soul and the, um, the, the voice, or the spirit, soul, and the voice. And so we see here uh, that the word ka also means name. So we can see all these correlations that we saw in these other African languages, we see the same theme happening in the ancient Egyptian. And so we see this at the top here. So in, in the ancient Egyptian, we have ka meaning name, and then ka meaning to say. Uh, the same thing in a twi, even though it's a different word, the same associations are, are there. So in uh, this badin, uh, which means to name, and then the den to call. Same correlations, um, both dealing with the same, they're, they're different roots as far as Egyptian and Twi is concerned, but within their respective languages, the same root for name or to name is the word for to call. And, um, and so in other languages, they may keep one meaning of the name, but in, in other related languages, they may have another. Uh, semantic meaning and so this is what we see in this lower half of this particular slide and so in the Hebrew the Shem is name and fame and Arabic uh, ism uh, is the same thing um, but the same root is not used for name in these other languages but it still correlates with uh, speech and so a proclamation a report a speech or to say uh, we see these in these respective languages and so you know fundamentally all of these languages that we're talking about are ultimately related and relatable and so these languages um, you know keep these same terms and they're they're being used in relatively the same way and so here's just another example of in the ancient Egyptian language for instance uh, in these other different languages uh, the concept of how to mention or to remember or memory or call the mind um, is also associated with name and so we see uh, there's a little bit of metathesis here, and metathesis is a switching of syllables and or um, sounds uh, that are that are closely together in the actual word. And and so we see this uh, here in the uh, the Yoruba, the Arabic, the Assyrian, the Hebrew, and the ancient Egyptian. But what is what I wanted to point out here was over here in this this section. So we see that the determinative. This is sakha. Uh, this is the S and then the, the the aspirated K sound, which we represent as an X, um, but with the true font, this is how it looks like it's the H with the loop under it. And then this is one of the um, the graphemes for this sound um, here that we said is a Uvar 
uh, a nasalized uvular trill, which is a, a, a nasalized R type sound. So that's what it is. So that's this word right here for those who are not familiar with the ancient Egyptian writing script. And so this is a quote unquote silent determinative. It just lets you know the context by which this word exists because remember that the ancient Egyptians didn't write out their vowels. And so these determinatives become very important. But we see here that the determinative is of a seated man pointing to his mouth. And so this remembrance, this memory, a call to mind is associated with speaking because, you know, the, the, the speech is very important. So it's just showing you how the name is something that is, is called, it is voiced, it's, it's the vocalization of spirit uh, in, in, the, in the soul of someone. And so to reinforce this in a living tradition, um, I want to introduce to some this particular text is called African Religion Defined, a Systematic Study of Ancestor Worship Among the Akan. Um, the second edition came out in 2013. The cover that you see here is the first edition, but this is by Dr. Anthony uh, Ephraim Dancor, uh, who is a, a king in Ghana uh, and a professor out here in the United States. And so he wrote this particular book describing the Akan spiritual system and also his his life as a king and his instillment. And so uh, there's a particular point in, the, in his narrative where he's talking about the concept of the soul. And so he's quoting a Mr. Kwame Gayeki and, and he informs us uh, much about the soul and says that the soul, or Kwame Gayeki, for example, maintains that the okra, remember that word okra from earlier, which means soul and spirit, is located in the head. Although in general the Akan believe that the seat of the okra is the shoulders, or that the shoulders balance the soul in the head as the head. The seat of intelligence sits on the shoulders. Still, the fact is that to call anyone by name is to call the soul of that individual. And since the soul is an intangible agency, it is assumed that the dead has appeared in spirit. And so let's go back, you know, saying a few, you know, again, to, to say or to call somebody in terms of their name uh, speaks to the soul of the individual. And so to call someone's name is to call their soul, to call their spirit, as it says here. And not only that, that the seat of the soul is the head or the shoulders. And so let's, let's now look at the word for ka again and we see this symbol this is the ka which is on top of the head um, on in the ancient egyptian relief uh the statue of horaribra and we see that it is depicting the shoulders which houses the head and so this is the the, the seat is the the spirit or the soul of somebody is in their head and the, the shoulders is what holds up the soul which means that the spirit or the soul of a person is in their head. And we'll see how that plays out. So we see in the ancient Egyptian this, this paranary coming on. So again, we, when we see the hands raised of the ka, you know, the shoulders is what carries the head. You know, and then African people carry stuff on their head, which is why you see this determinative here of a man with his arm up holding something on his head, which means to carry the support. But it has that root here for okra in the Akan. So we're just going to call this okra for now. So the okra root to carry, to support. And, but we're also introduced, remember that he said that it's in the head. And so, you know, the same root is the word for thought or to think about or to plot. Um, and then, of course, again, we're introduced, reintroduced to Ka as the soul, the spirit, the personality, the essence. And um, Ka, uh, Okra, meaning to say. And so, the, what, is, what is key here, this, let's look at this here in the center. The question we have to ask is, why is the determinative of the seated man pointing to his mouth again? If this is about thought, to think about, or to plot. And so we got to understand that thoughts, that speech to say over here is just ex, ex, uh, vocalized thoughts. And so for the ancient mind, there is no difference between thinking in your head and speaking out loud. Speaking is thinking out loud. Like we, we even say that in modern times, if, if, if someone catches us talking to ourselves, we say, oh, I was just thinking out loud. 
And so for this, this is encapsulated in the language. And we see this visually with the ancient Egyptian um, uh, determinative here in the, in the hieroglyphs for the word for thought. And so we got to think about it like this. When we think to ourselves, there is a voice inside of our head. And often that voice sounds like us in real life. But nonetheless, when you think, you're thinking in terms uh, um, with a mechanism of sound. Now, what is, what is causing that sound in our head? We don't know. But we do understand that there is a sound. There's some talking. There's a voice in our head. And so when we so for the Africans there's no there's no difference between speaking inside of our head and speaking outside in the material world. And so the same uh the same words are used for particularly both concepts. And so <laughs> this is reinforced by Dr. Mudupe Oduyoye who written um, who's written an article in um, this particular book that we see here on the right hand side called Traditional Religion in West Africa, uh, edited by a uh, E. A. Ade Adegbola, uh, 1983, and then on page 283. So he's discussing the the Kra or the Kla, which we would get Okra from in the Akan, um, and, it, and he says something that's very profound uh, when discussing that. He says that we can think of Kra or Kla which would be the Ka or Kala in ancient Egypt as consciousness, the part of a man that responds to a calling. Let me repeat. We can then think of Kra Kla as consciousness, the part of a man that responds to a calling. And so again, that uh, the concept of voice, breath, and um, and uh, and this relationship to thinking and consciousness and the soul and the spirit of a person being un in their head as discussed by um, Dr. Darcourt uh, uh, in the earlier text. And so we see that all these concepts are interrelated in the African context. And so, you know, this gives us uh, an understanding of what spirit is. And so fundamentally spirit is a consciousness. It is a, is, it is a thought process. And so the thoughts and consciousness that is latent inside of our head expresses itself in the voice you know whether we're talking or whether we're singing chanting you know or invoking something you know this is all spirit and and spirituality you know in a sense it all deals with consciousness and so for those who have this idea that you know spirituality has nothing to do with the brain and and thinking and things of this nature are, are is, as far as African spirituality is concerned, um, I would have to say is, you know, fundamentally uh, a, a mistake. And so what the language is, it, the languages are telling us is that this concept of spirit is connected to consciousness. Um, and, and so we'll, we'll get into some more evidence as we, we move across the continent of Africa, finding these same conceptual themes. That, that we have explored already in our particular text. And so again, to reemphasize that the soul has to deal with consciousness and intelligence, we see this association with the head as discussed by Darkor, and we see here in ancient Egypt. But also, we should understand that this, this Ka is also symbolized by a cow's head. And it's actually this cow's head that is when turned upside down becomes the Aleph, in the Phoenician and Hebrew languages uh, in terms of their sign and which was borrowed in the Greek which became Alpha and later became our English symbol for A. Um, <laughs> and so you know it all comes from here so it all comes from a cow's head is literally a word for head and so um, <laughs> and so now we're going to move on and so to to also demonstrate that you know that the the concept of spirit and the soul or whatnot is dealing with mind and consciousness and intelligence. Uh, we we see another rendition for the word for soul in the ancient Egyptian language, which is some some vocalized as the ba. But as we discussed earlier, this particular um, symbol here, which it looks like a number three, is not a an a sound. It is an L or an R. And so we see in these other languages that this concept of soul is, you know, associated with reason, sense, to be wise, intelligence, 
in the Matakam language, genius, spirit, Mboku, Bele Bele, hey, genius, and the Fulfulde, which is the Fulani language, uh, Mbelu, the vital principle in man, one that's in danger of being devoured by soul leaders. Um, in the Semitic languages, it's Baal, spirit, mind, Hermetic, Bel, they didn't write out their vowels either. Spirit, intelligence. Northern Syriac, Bala, reason, attention. Arabic, Baal, this is a long A. Uh, attention, consciousness, mind. So we're seeing a correlation here between spirit and mind. And so, again, spirit, mind, one and the same. And so spirit, mind, breath, vocalizing, name, all a part of the same semantic field. And, and they're represented by the same um, languages. I mean, excuse me, by the same roots. And so uh, it's, it's interesting, you know, this correlation. Um, again, the, the Ba, which is the so-called soul in the um, ancient Egyptian language and literature, is symbolized by a bird. And uh, it's a turtle dove to be exact. And so um, at the bottom here, this is Dr. Alan Anselin again, uh, giving us the cognates for the word for bird and turtle dove in these different African languages, showing the, the paronymy and why they were able to uh, use the bird to represent the, the soul in um, ancient Egypt. And so um, this is one uh, rendition of the so-called Ba or the Baal or the Bala uh, of the soul of the ancient Egyptians. And so they're giving you a depiction here um, of a human head with a bird's body. And this, is, this isn't done arbitrarily. There's a correlation between these two. Because remember, the soul, the spirit, is associated with wind. Remember we discussed earlier that same root, the same BR root for, for wind and movement is the same roots for consciousness and things of that nature. And so it's also the same roots for wings and to fly. And so this same root is a dialectical variation of what we find in the word kepper that we saw earlier, which is a dung beetle with its wings. Um, but it's also a word for, for consciousness, and so, um, you know, these are paronyms, but they're, they're associated, you know, because they sound alike, and um, they're, they're relatable within the, the semantics of the, the ancient Africans. And so they're saying here that it's a consciousness, and it's a free consciousness, a free-floating thing that it moves kind of like a bird, you know, that it, that it can transfer across time and space. And so, you know, we're, we're brought back over here, you know, um, we remember these terms. So when we talked about the ba, it is is the process of metathesis is rebo or ria. You know, in these different languages, because that b sound turned into h, uh, and then in other languages it turned into an m. You know, uh, so it's rojo. This is the this, the ba is just the the syllables are reversed uh, in these in these particular uh, languages. So the spirit, soul, all the same thing. And so we see this, you know, these correlations again in these other African languages. So the Bantu Boa is the R, L is drop, spirit, soul. Um, Billy, chest, because the chest is associated with the breath. Um, Bara, name, to call. Uh, and then Nvidi, spirit again, that's the Ba. Uh, Lumfuilu, understanding, intelligence in the Chiluba language. And so the same root that gives us these, uh, you know, um, they're, they're relatable in that sense, and I should say that in the, the Chiluba language, when an R or L sound, this L right here, is followed by an I, this L turns into a D. So that's why we see Nvidi instead of Nvilu or Nvila or, or something like that, Nvidi or Vila. And, um, and so because it has this I, it, it caused this sound change, it motivated this sound change. But these are the same words that we see here in terms of understanding, intelligence, and spirit. All the same concept. In the Kikongo language, um, the ba or bara becomes bendo uh, because there's another sound um, rule that when the L is uh, preceded by N, it turns into D. And so that's what we see here in terms of the, the same word. So this is the electronically radiated shadow, as Fukial tells us, proto-bantu, banda, ghost, which is really just a word for spirit, and banda, uh, Banda, medicine man, one who deals with the spirits, because the spirits are housed in the medicine, and the Bambada, Ba, the essence of a person, the spirit, they, too, just like in certain other Bantu languages, they drop the R or L sound. And again, these numbers are present in, in Wagner's comparative lexical study of Sumerian.
And so we're seeing this, these, these, all these concepts are, are, are related and they correlate, you know, saying with each other. So we're getting a better understanding of what a spirit is. And so a spirit is just a consciousness that expresses itself either, you know, saying wind is a vital principle because of the movement and, and also in someone's name, which is someone's soul. And, um, the, the, the intelligence, the mind, the thinking process itself, you know, in terms of spirituality. So we'll uh, continue here. And so this is just to give another example of the, the concept of intelligence and, and spirit, you know, in association with the heart and the inside. And so in the Chiluba language, we have the word moyo, which is heart, life, mind, soul, courage, will, desire, inclination, sense, mood, thought, salvation, and greeting. Um, the same word in the ancient Egyptian language is what we call the yeb or the ab, which is the heart, uh, which is the heart, mind, understanding, intelligence, will, desire, mood, wish, think, believe, feel, fancy, perceive. Again, this word for ab, for heart, mind, and understanding again, um, we see the same thing. You see this over here? This is determinative with the man pointing to his mouth. Because what is in your heart, what is in your mind comes out in your speech. You know, and so that's why it, it's pointing here to, to show you that it, it belongs under that particular thing. So to perceive anything still, because there's a voice in your head. And so there's no difference between, at least in the African mind, the voice in your head and the voice that, um, that, that you speak with. And so at the bottom here, this is also the Chiluba language. Uh, this is a totally different word, but we're still seeing the association between spirit, intelligence, and, and logic and you know enforcing energy all this uh you know coming from uh the not necessarily the same roots but we're seeing this um the, these correlations no matter what words we use and so um again this is there's there's a correlation and so when you're talking about a spirit you're talking about a consciousness you're talking about a thought process um a, a perception and intelligence and a certain type of understanding and and logic and so this is what we see here. This is what the ancient uh, languages are telling us. And so I guess here's another example, again, um, from the Sesotho language. We're not, you know, arguing for cognizance. We're just saying that the these concepts are defined the same way. And so in the Sesotho language, uh, Lelopo, spirit and wish doctor, they have moya, air, wind, breath, spirit, simoya. You see this is the same root mentally and spirit. So mentality, spirit, all the same thing. So we see uh, what I argue is this word Samoya is the same word um, Seba, learning to teach to instruct be wise in um, the ancient Egyptian language. And um, and so this, this R of nasalized was, was uh, <laughs> became a Y. This also interchanges with Y in uh, the African languages. And so what we know here is that, okay, so that's in the Chiluba, that's in Central Africa that we spoke of earlier in the ancient Egyptian, and so now we're going to the Yoruba, and we'll see that this concept of spirit also is associated with the head, just like uh, what we saw amongst the Akan. And so this particular uh, citation is coming from a Baba Obafemi Orungwa, uh, Gil Babalao, who lives out in Oakland, um, in, in California. In his blog, he was writing about Ori, that one of the, Ori is one of those words for spirit there in spirit double that we saw earlier uh, in our discourse. And so in, in discussing the Ori, he says that, that the Ori represents uh, the individual capacity for astral travel. Excuse me, that, uh, let me back up. Let me read it correctly. In the universal symbolic language, Iye Ororo, the bird of descent, that's what you see over here on, on the right, the bird of descent. It represents individual capacity for astral travel. Placed atop the king's crown, it communicates female spiritual authority. Organized around what might be termed the bird society. Similarly, the bird that tops the staff of the divinity of herbal wisdom, Oshanyan, denotes medical medicinal potency. Likewise, Ile Ori, now we're dealing with the word Ori, the shrine dedicated, this word Ile means house, so it's the house of Ori, what houses the spirit which is what you see here, this, which is a shrine. The shrine dedicated to the divinity within is completely covered in bird symbolism. Covered uh, in cowries, it's supposed to be in, if you can see that, it's 
kind of blacked out, uh, cowries and top with a bird, Ile Ori conceals an allusion to a certain bird whose white feathers are suggested by the overlapping cowries. In this instance, the bird symbolizes the emblem of the mind that God places in the head of every human being at the time of birth. Everywhere there is this mystic bird appears in Yoruba sacred arts, it seems to signify spiritual evolution and divine consciousness. So again, we're seeing a correlation between spirit and the mind. And so the word, you know, saying um, Aurora, is, which is word for bird, it's the same root that we get Ori from. Because again, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing dealing with movement. But again, they, there's a certain part of the, the original word that was dropped, uh, which is the H sound in the Yoruba language. But is present in the other African languages as an H, P, or B, uh, or F sound. And so again, so we're just we're just finding more and more proof that you know for the African, and, I'm, and I hope I'm representing you know a general you know consensus in terms of Africa in terms of these major uh, population centers um, for this concept of, of, of spirit. So showing in the ancient Egyptian is showing that this is a very age old concept, and showing that it's still manifesting in the same way that. Um, that we're talking about here. So as I spoke about earlier, to think is to speak. Speech is simply outward thinking. One hears the voice in, in the head when one is thinking. Thus, thought is simply organized sounds, speech in one's head. This is why the ancients considered creation the manifestation of God's speech. In Egyptian we call this Medunetur, God's word. So the hieroglyphic writing script that you see is called Medunetur in um, or that we saw earlier is called metanature by the ancient Egyptians which is called God's speech and so we're, we're again we're building up a theme here so if we are spirit and that means we come from a spirit world and everything is a manifestation of spirit and the concept of spirit is associated with thought and speech this is why the ancient Egyptians called their script which is just simply a representation of everything that we see in nature God's words because everything we see in nature is an expression is a calling of or excuse me uh, the creator uh, speaking things into existence making the the thought or the spirit become manifest in in uh, a, a reality that we understand today and so this is uh, backed up by this the same mentality is backed up amongst the the Fulani and the Bambara in West Africa as far away as uh, Mali, and so uh, Amadou Hampati Ba, which was a a, a great uh, oral historian um, from Mali, a Fulani to be exact, uh, he wrote a particular text called uh, an article called the Living Tradition, and you can find it in UNESCO's General General History of Africa Volume One, uh, 1981. So on page 170. He, he discusses this concept of speech amongst, uh, as far as the Malayan understanding of, of God's speech. And so just this peep how this, this, this manifests itself. So it says in the text, let me point out, and that's Hapati Ba pointing out though, that at this level, when he's talking about speaking, the, the term speaking and listening refer to realities far more vast than those we usually attribute to them. It is said, the speech of Mangala, which is the creator, is seen, is heard, is smelled, is tasted, is touched. It is a total perception, a knowing in which the entire being is engaged. In the same way, since speech is the externalization of the vibrations of forces, every manifestation of a force in any form whatever is to be regarded as its speech. That is why everything in the universe speaks. Everything is speech that has taken on body and shape. So, everything that we see in existence is a form of speech. And it is a vocalization, just like how, when I, like, you can hear my voice now because I'm vocalizing my thoughts. This is, this is something that is tangible uh, in terms of your senses is concerned. That there's a underlying consciousness and thought that permeates throughout the universe. That this force, we'll say the Inyama or the Ashe, uh, vibrates this fundamental consciousness and begins to shape 
and become things. And since sound is associated with wind, breath, movement, and uh, also voice, we say that because everything moves and everything vibrates like the waves of sound, then everything is the speech of the creator. And so this is what uh, we reinforce. So the same concept which we find in ancient Egypt, uh, we find over here in West Africa. And so for us, spirit and consciousness are one and the same. And um, <laughs> we're now going to do like a little case study. Uh, we're still going to be in Mali, but this time instead of the Fulani or the Bambara, we're going to be dealing with the Dogon. And so this is a picture of some Dogon elders uh, from Mali. And so they, they have become famous because of their tracking of the stars, Sirius B, and uh, the stories written in the Pale Fox, and the conversations with Ogotamela by um, Griole, Marcel Griole, uh, who was a French anthropologist, you know, who spent many years with them and, you know, Gate introduced basically introduced them to the to the Western world and their philosophy, and so these are some of the elders from that community. And so uh, this is a Toguna, which is the house of words uh, for the Dogon. So the, if you read any of their their the, the text about them, you will understand the importance of the word, the sound, and speech, not only to creation itself, but to uh, our social creation. And so they have a house of words. This is where they meet and discuss things. And so, um, again, this is just them in their ritual. There's a, a city plan for a Dogon village. And uh, in the Dogon speech concept, we talk about the word is a seed. Uh, the word is made up of hearing, voice, and breath. Kind of like what uh, the Fulani talk about uh, as articulated by Amadaha Pati Ba. And the word me is a living voice or harmony. And so, you know, again, for them, uh, the, this concept of speech is not simply uh, with the voice, but it's dealing with breathing, breath, and also hearing. Because, you know, uh, it also deals with waves. And so, you know, uh, it, the speech is so prevalent that, you know, they have a concept, basically a 360 understanding of things. And so they break it down in terms of words. And so uh, there's a the word so in their language, which is this word here, is the word for, for speech. And so giri so is the front word, bini so is the side word, bolo so is the back word, so dai is the clear word, aduno so is the astonishing word. And so if you, you know, the front word is what is plain, but, you know, the clear word is what is given after you understand the front, side, and back word. So when you have a full understanding, of the deep um, aspects of, of, of speech or a concept, then and only then can you have a clear and astonishing word. And so, uh, Griole in the and the Ursuline, the co-author in the book *The Pale Fox*, gives us a couple of tidbits that help us to understand the relationship between the voice, the spirit, the soul, consciousness the naming process, all of that which we discussed earlier. And I, I chose the Dogon because I think that they as far as written sources are concerned, are the most clear and give us the best uh, articulation of the fundamentals of African spirituality in science. Not saying that they, uh, you know, have the only, I'm just saying in terms of a written form that is accessible to those in the English world, this is the best articulation, in my opinion, of you know the the concepts in which we're trying to understand here and so I'll be reading several different paragraphs that uh, articulate the relationship between the the consciousness and the vocalization and signs and symbols and things of these nature and the manifestation of the material world and um, so because this is fundamentally what spirituality is and deals with and so now uh, Ama preserved the whole for he had traced within himself the design of the world and of its extension. For Alma had designed the universe before creating it. So remember that the concept of spirit, wherever there is sky, there is spirit. The, the spirit world is, is basically what surrounds us. It is what is in us. And Alma, which is the name for God amongst the Dogon, 
uh, before creating the world says here that they traced within himself because Amma is an infinite being nothing can exist outside of Amma so he can only trace within himself uh, the designs of the world and so <laughs> he says each of the four sectors thus formed contained originally eight drawings each of which in turn produced eight more thus the oval which is uh, Amma contained eight by eight by four which is 256 outlines to which were added eight uh, two per semi-axis and two for the center. The total was then 266 signs, that's supposed to be signs, of Ama. Ama Bumo. The word Bumo means signs. And the reason why I put this here is because when I first read this I was intrigued because I was already familiar with a divination system uh, from Nigeria amongst the Yoruba people called Ifa. And the word I, uh, Ifa comes from that same root that deals with movement, breath, spirit, and all of that, and vocalizations and things of that nature. But that's another discussion. But we say the, the phrase Odu Ifa. And the Odus, the word Odu means oracular utterances. And so these are the, 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 the proverb stories and things associated with the oracle. So oracular utterances. And there's 256 fundamental Odus. And so it's interesting that you have these Odus, which are the spirit of the world, these particular codes uh, that manifest themselves in terms of materiality, that we have the same number associated with the Dogon, except they say 256 outlines or signs. And so we'll come to realize later on that in terms of a consciousness, in terms of signs, that for the African and in the terms of words, there's no separation. They're one and the same. So if I draw a symbol, it's still speech. And so it, they're, they're still already, and they're used also for divination amongst the Dodon. And so uh, these two separate cultures are, have basically the same deep-seated underlying you know, consciousness and even the same amount of, of signs created by the Creator which manifest themselves in terms of material that we see uh, or the reality that we see before us. And so this is why I wanted to introduce this particular uh, slide. And so, you know, he goes on to talk about the guide signs, the, you know, the master signs, uh, you know, in terms of complete signs and, you know, being representations of Ama. And so <laughs> he says that this hierarchy of figures that composes the central picture is in harmony with the descent and extension of the world. It bears the name of articulated, organized signs of the world and descent, indicating that each of the three categories performs a particular function in the development of the universe. The guide signs show the way to the eight master signs. And so, again, what, he, what they're trying to articulate here is that these particular signs outline everything that we see in the universe. These particular consciousness, these particular words, so to speak, or symbols, uh, or codes, is, is fundamentally what makes up the world. And so it's different combinations of the Bumo and the Yoruba, it's different combinations of Odu that bring about the, the universe. And so this is kind of like, for those who are familiar with computer programming and codes, this is, this is how your computer operates. Is, is, is a fundamental set that, uh, that, that each of your websites or computer programs operate as codes. And when the electricity, you know, hits these codes, then it presents itself on the screen as Facebook, as yourblackworld.com, as this presentation, as Microsoft Word, etc. And so the same, the same logic that allows your computer to work the way that it works is what these ancient Africans are saying operates in the universe itself. Instead of saying the word code, they didn't have the word code. Uh, they had the words for sign or words. So that's what they use. Signs and words. Signs amongst and words amongst the, uh, the Dogon and simply words or Odu in um, the Yoruba language. And so it's Medu in the ancient Egyptians. So we say the Medu Netcher that's what they're talking about. It's the same concept here. The same the symbols 
you know, which make up the universe. And so, Griole and Diorchene go on to say that the guide signs show or make known the series of the eight master signs. Those are those additional, uh, these guide signs and the, the master signs make up the additional ten signs we saw earlier, given the 256 number 266. This is to say that they govern and classify the following signs. As for the eight master signs, they give soul and life force to everything. And so again, we see this this association with signs, which are words, uh, giving soul and life. They're the life force of everything. In addition, these ten signs determine whether a thing is great or small in volume. Finally, the complete signs of the world give all things color, form, and substance. Thus, they they allow an, an understanding of the creation. For one knows the root, the principle, or essence of things by their form, their substance, their color. This amounts to saying that signs, manifestations of creative thought, see that? This amounts to saying that signs, which are manifestations of creative thought, existed before the things that they determined. In the Dogon world, I, in the Dogon word idea, all things are manifested by thought. They are not known by, therefore do not exist in themselves. So everything that we see is an outward project and everything that we witness, uh, that we hear, we touch, smell, everything based on our senses is an outward expression of a thought process. And so this thought process is what the what they say the creator did and so that these signs represent thoughts of the creator and so these these thoughts these words and they're also associated with the words as we can see here manifested themselves as the reality so it's no different than how we do before we create any work of art we write a song you know write a play you know create a building everything exists as a thought in our head first and then we move outwardly to bring those thoughts into manifestation. And so what they're arguing is what we witness amongst ourselves as human beings, the same thing happened with the Creator. And so the thoughts, the signs, the symbols, the words, the concepts existed prior to the manifestation of the universe as we understand it. And so the, there's, there's, it's an, the, the, the universe itself is an expression of the signs, the words, the thoughts. And so that's what they're telling us here. And so uh, they go on to say that Amma's signs, as we talked about earlier, which he sent into the world, went entered into things which at the moment became. And so, uh, again, the word, the signs, manifested themselves and became a reality. And that's all they're really trying to say here in the short clip here. <coughs> We get a little bit more clarity here, and, and um, I want you to pay attention. You can even pause and and just just read it on your own, um, or, or you know listen as I go through. But this is very critical for us to get, and I'm just going to read it. But if the sign precedes the thing signified, it is dependent upon conscious and active mind. It is said, "Ama in the beginning things chose the bumo, which is a word for signs, with thought." The first design, it is through the work of thought, that's supposed to be thought, that it was divided into four. It is also by this that the final design in four parts was made. It is the mind which conceived and produced the initial design and which perfected it by dividing it so as to specify the essence of things. In its first state, the sign is an articulated whole then divided into four parts, permitting the recognition of the basic elements which give rise to the thing. But a thing, in turn, is a re-articulation of the parts forming a complete and unique whole, which is the thing itself. The sign of Amma is one whole. Amma broke it down into distinct parts. He presented the image of the four elements. The thing existed by forming a whole. And so, this pretty much kind of sums up, you know, and, and verifies in practice all of what we saw earlier in the language. That the concept of speech, that the concept of thought, the concept of spirit of the soul and uh, manifestation of reality of things are all conceived, you know, as a, as a harmony of ideas. And this is just one expression of how 
you know, one African system put this all together. And so there's, you know, there's a, 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 a bit more detail that you really have to kind of get the book to, you know, really get the full breadth of what we're talking about here. But I'm just taking these small excerpts and, and informing you of how this relationship works. And so when we're talking about spirit, we're talking about thought, we're talking about consciousness. That's what a spirit is. And so it's not a, uh, a white ghost in terms of Casper floating around. It's not something to be scared, scared of in terms of spook and, and spirits are coming to possess you and carry you off if you do something bad. It's a frame of mind. A spirit is a frame of mind. It's a consciousness. It is a it is a thought pattern, and 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 this is what we're seeing in the languages and in the living traditions. And so, and having sprung into the, into existence, we're still on the Dogon. The thing becomes conscious of itself. So, as we saw with um, the way of the elders book, how we talk about how spirit becomes conscious, the Dogon are saying the same thing. And having sprung into existence. The thing, that which manifested itself from spirit, becomes conscious of itself, comprehends itself, as indicated by the presence of the kikinu, which is a word for soul, uh, say, you know, the intelligent soul in the side. So the soul, again, is associated with a consciousness that is conscious of itself. And so and we, we, we already understood earlier that the soul of something is its name. The name and the soul are one and the same. And so when you give something a name, you basically what you're doing is articulating the spirit that is in essence, that is the essence of the manifestation of it. And so what we see in terms of physical forms, these are just receptacles in essence of a spirit consciousness that is animated by the energy form of spirit. So it so spirit manifests itself in two primary fashions as energy, as active energy, and as a consciousness, a thought, a a a thought pattern, so to speak, the mind. And so this is what the, you know this this is what is reinforcing here. So everything that we talked about earlier is just leading us up to this point. And so, uh, again, moreover, as we have seen, first the sign, because the sign, the spirit, the soul, all of these are the same thing. And the Odu, the sign and the word are the same thing in the African context. And then the diagrams are evidence of the genesis of the thing they represent. Whereas the drawing realizes it and therefore leads it to its end. It is said, the sign which one writes is the good to come. The drawing that one draws is, after the good, the bad which follows. In Amma's body were the signs, that is, by accumulating signs. The signs went into each thing, transformed themselves into drawings, drew the departure toward the end, that is, marked the beginning of the transition. The sign is a good thing, always there. The drawing is a thing that has an end. To draw is to make something begin to be, thus marking the first step toward destruction. And so, this you know again you may have to pause this and read this on your own but what this is telling us here is is really fundamentally giving you a the science behind Africans African art because African art is not done for art's sake this concept of art for art's sake is a more modern Western thing when we do art in indigenous societies in Africa it is ritual it is a form of what we in modern times call the quote-unquote secret or the law of attraction. And so when you draw something, when you carve something, because these are all words, remember, these are the beginnings of the manifestation of what these concepts mean to the host person. And so when you see the ancient Egyptians drawing on all that stone and things, they weren't doing it simply for the sake of art. Or simply just to record history. They were they were drawing to manifest, they were writing to manifest their ideas into reality. And so this was the ritual for doing it. So when you see these African art and things of that nature, it is done so that we we have a focal point and that it vibrates or resonates in the same spirit or energy of 
the 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 concept for which we're trying to manifest in our real life. And so this is what this talks about here. I will read this over again. And so this brings us into the science of sound. And so what the the people in Ghana call Inyame, the Yoruba call Ashe. And the word Ashe is uh, a word that means law or or voice or speech. And so that same Inyame, that same energy of spirit of speech. And so uh, Ernest Cladney, who uh, in 1787 published his discoveries concerning the theory of music, which laid the foundations for the science of acoustics. What you're seeing on the right hand side, he did some experiments in which he put some granules of sand on a plate and he struck the edge of a plate with different, you know, with a violin um, string or, you know, chord, whatever you call it. And he strummed it and when he, the, or the bow, the violin bow, he strummed it and these types of patterns is what was uh, left at the top of the the plate and so you know this this was a a very scientific breakthrough and so fundamentally what it uh, demonstrated is that sound is behind or sound waves is behind the shapes which we see in nature and so this is some scientific backing for or modern scientific backing for what the ancient Africans were always saying that quote unquote God spoke things into existence that everything is God's speech and so you see these signs these fundamental signs of nature being strung up uh, or, or, or being um, uh, developed just by changing the pitch of the sound uh, of the the violin bow you know uh, strumming on the edge and so these figures have been you know been um, since the 1700s has come to be known as Cladney figures and so after Ernest Cladney you know who uh, discovered this pattern in the Western world and so what I'm going to do now is play this audio and you'll see in the modern rendition that the um, that they're using you know more modern sonic you know uh, devices or whatnot and but what you'll see here is the the in modern times they're pouring these granules on the um, on the metal plate and they have it hooked up to a sonic device and you'll see these various different shapes and so uh, hopefully this will play um, uh, it's coming up as a black screen but you can hear it um, you can see it, I don't know why it's coming up black um, well you can look it up on YouTube just look up for a Clatney plate and you will you will see you will see it live yeah uh, again there's many different experiments that you can find on YouTube I was hoping that it would show up here but for some reason um, it is not and you know I want to go back and it's still not doing it so um, I will just stop it and continue um, but I, I was hoping to show you that um, live but it's it, it's not showing up so um, I'll just continue. Um, the picture that we see here is of Dr. Malado Musome. He is the husband of Sabon Fusome, who we saw earlier, who wrote the book, The Spirit of Intimacy. And so he, he actually has written a book called Of Water and the Spirit. And relatively recently, he did a lecture in Europe and where he was talking about the fundamentals of, you know, the, the spirit behind the book. And there was a part during the question and answer where he starts talking about uh, the nature of sound in ritual and speech in ritual and so I was hoping that I could download the video but it wouldn't let me download so I don't have it so what I did was I transcribed the 
the question and answer or his answer you know relating to a particular question as it regards opening spiritual gates and so at the top of this uh, slide here you can see the um, the the actual link so you can you know look at the whole lecture but uh, here I'm just going to read it and you know it's going to speak fundamentally to what we were talking about uh, earlier so it says to be able to break it down and again he's he's talking about opening gates spiritual gates to the spirit world to be able to break it down into pieces there is what we call the discursive part then there is the melodic part any person who speaks is singing there is a way in which you can determine the frequency of your verbal rendition and there is a specific frequency that you have to stay with in order to trigger the opening of the other world so in other there's a way that you sing or a way that you speak that um, opens the gates to the spiritual world but and, and so he goes on to say it's not like a sentence that you can say any way you like and then it would happen no and by the way it is dangerous to say it, it the wrong way something else might happen you might get zapped out of there that's why I think that you know the dagger are very smart by leaving that only to people who go through initiation who learn how to control that and there are many verbal keys like this for example there is the one that can make you completely visible in other words there's a speech or a, a pattern that can make you invisible according to Melodoma Soma. it can even make you invisible to a camera and so what he's saying is that the ancient Africans had discovered this the these fundamental tones that you know uh, have allows us to have access to the world of spirit and so these are for the most part kept secret in African initiation systems or wisdom traditions and um, so he's reinforcing this concept which I was hoping to let y'all see in the other uh, the clip but that you know sound can make things happen and so in ancient Egyptian language this is a word called heka which is you know words of magic so to speak you know in Yoruba we say the ashe we can speak our ashe on it and so we see these, these same ideas you know across the continent of Africa and so uh, Maladoma Somme goes on to continue and he reinforces again you remember he's in Burkina Faso uh, 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 again he says a person's name is associated with a specific function a person's name is an energy signature and so a name that is randomly assigned to somebody could affect that person positively, positively or negatively and so he's given us a little bit more insight here into what a name is so if we know what a name is we know what the soul of a thing is and so he's saying that it is a specific it serves one as a, a specific function so there's a code behind it again a thought behind it so it serves a particular function and then that person's name is an energy signature and so it's, it's an ID basically so just how like you assign your checks and, it, and it's specific to you it's the same way in terms of these energy patterns in the universe. There are signatures, and there are certain signatures that we that are that are given names, which is the soul of the thing that represents, you know, that it, it, that energy signature. The name uh, I'm talking about. And so I hope I hope you're you're grasping this the relationship between the spirit, name, the soul, and all of this. It, it's all interwoven together. And so keep in mind even what we read from the Dogon when we're talking about the signs, which is the soul of the universe, and, and, and how they serve specific, specific functions, you know, in the universe. So uh, basically we say that the signs or the words of God are basically the laws of nature. And the laws is what allows matter to be the way that it is. And so the Inyama, the Ashe, the energy movement, forces the universe to move and collide or the atoms so to speak in a certain way and when certain atoms collide in a certain way or join you know there are rules for what should happen given the association of these different configurations and so there are code or laws or rules in the universe um, kinda like in the matrix 
and that you know uh, provide us the reality which we we see today and so this is a a, a manifestation of that and so uh, to give some other textual evidence of this concept of speech being able to open gates and do things um, there's a book called After God is the Bia by John uh, Ume uh, Evo Cosmology, Divination and Sacred Science in Nigeria Volume 1 here's Volume 2 which is very hard to find I need to find it myself but um, <coughs> he he talks about you know the Dabias which are the, uh, basically the priests and elders um, who speak on behalf of God uh, or the God of light and that commands and possesses the Atu or the potent mouth uh, thus saying among the Ebos uh, after God is the Bia so just like in Kemet the defining operational aspect of the Ebo worldview is expressed truth is life falsehood is death the Bia's claim descent from ancient Kemet um, again the, the, the focus here is this concept of the potent mouth and that is to be able to speak certain things into existence and so John Ume in After God is the Bia, meaning, you know, in terms of, of knowledge, like after God is the priest, and um, which is called the Debia, uh, or the medicine man, um, so to speak. And so he's, he's basically, to give a summary before I start reading, um, he's talking about the importance of saying the names, here we go with that word name, the soul of the spirit, correctly as far as the universe is concerned uh, just like how Maladoma said that you have to say it in a certain way you can't say thir certain things in uh, just any old kind of way that, this is a way that you have to say it and so uh, in Burkina Faso you have one example given by Maladome of this philosophy and now we're having this relatable amongst the Igbo in Nigeria so he, he, he gives a, uh, an example from his, his childhood uh, and, and as, far, as far as this initiation process. And so he says, if the assistance of the brave is appealed for at the warmonger's place, the brave would take up his shield or armor. Uh, there was actually a, a able proverb, which this is supposed to be the translation of it, so I forgot to put that there. But anyway, and, and so it is fundamental that the Dabia, the priest, must know the true name and the pronunciation thereof of the herbs, roots, animals, birds, fish, reptiles, stones, minerals, stars, liquids, gases, soils, spirit, deities, days, times of the day, ages, periods, phases, places, sites, world ages, numbers, etc., connected with the universe, the Bia's word, Ogu, which is medicines, and so on. My father was very insistent on this very insistent on knowing the proper names, the true names of these particular manifestations of spirit. I still remember a heated argument he once had with Ikegba Dunu, alias Obukambakwe Onuba Onumba, who was one of the great Debias in, in my town and died around nineteen fifty three. My father asked him to name the various herbs. He Ikegba had a symbol for fashioning, Ogu. He succeeded in naming about half the log and then held the remainder together and pronounced him. Agata na Ibiom Ogu, which literally translates chaotic and miscellaneous herbs for making Ogu, medicines. My father objected and insisted that for any herb or root or unit for making Ogu to be potent and to do its work efficiently and is required, you must call it by its true name and tell it what it normally does and instruct it on what you want it to do in the Ogu under preparation. So he's saying that you have to know the true name, that means the true signature, the, the true speech or voice behind uh, the spirit behind the medicine. If you don't know this, and you don't know its true name, the, the medicine won't be potent, because remember in Africa, medicine isn't just about you taking some Advil, taking some water and going to sleep. You also have to speak to the medicine and, you know, use words of power and, and song and, 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 uh, as part of the remedy um, to, to, again, to bring out the potency of the medicine so that you can heal. And so this is what they're talking about here. So he continues, my father concluded that failing to do so reduces Ogu preparation, medicine preparation, to a hit or miss affair. And the potency, a matter of accident rather than a well-programmed expected outcome. 
He further illustrated by stating that if someone comes into a hall full of people and merely stands and mopes at them without mentioning the name of the person he or she is looking for and without telling the person when found why he or she is being looked for, in other words, what to do, the man or woman must have wasted his or her time visiting, for no one will respond or act for him or her. And so what this is saying here is, is the, the concept behind knowing the true names of the spirit behind the phenomena is that it's just like calling somebody out in a crowd if you don't call them by name they won't know that they're um, being called and then when you find them and you don't tell them what to do then there's then you're wondering well why did you call me in the first place if if you know you didn't have any purpose for our engagement and so, you know, we know the names and if you read any of the ancient Egyptian literature, you know that they're very particular about knowing the names of the Netaru or the spirits or the, the divinities. And so uh, from ancient Egypt to modern Nigeria, the same concept uh, and the same instructions exist. And so we see this amongst the Ifa practitioners. This is the Babalawo, uh, Wande Abiyambola, um, who has written numerous books. As the you know the representative of Ifa over here, uh, or one of the primary representatives of Ifa here in the United States, and he basically supports with his text uh, the the same uh, ideas that we saw in Master Ebo in terms of the the relationship to sound and words uh, to the potency of medicine. So he says that Yoruba medicine is very closely connected with incantations and powerful words that one must utter. Sometimes if you don't utter these words, medicines don't come alive. Most of these words have their roots in Ifa, God of Wisdom. So again, this concept of the sound activating the spirit and, and from the spirit world is, is, you know, associated with God. It's the same thing that is associated with you know herbal medicines and things and so there, again there's this relationship you gotta know the names you gotta know the spirit and the soul of a thing if you can call on it and command it to work in your favor then you have a better chance of you know getting done or manifesting what you want in this life than if you was to just leave it up to chance and so this is the the African uh, spiritual concept here and so I have another video I'm not sure if this will play um, I wanted to show you uh, the Babalawo, a Babalawo who lived in Atlanta, who in, in real life is using these words of power to activate, you know, uh, something in his hand in the video. Just in case this doesn't play for you, uh, again, you can you go to YouTube and just type in Babalawo from Atlanta Part Two, and this video will come up. So you'll see this little. This will probably be the first. Uh, clip in the video so it's, it's on YouTube currently for those who are watching and um, and so no um, it's, it's not playing I don't know what's uh, wrong um, why the video isn't playing in this PowerPoint presentation but um, you know and this is something that you have to see it's not something that you you can just hear uh, so again, just go to the Babalawa from Atlanta Part Two on on YouTube and and see this. And so go, you know, towards you know you can watch the whole thing, but what what I'm talking about is towards the end. So he actually speaks to an object in his hand and it rises. And so he's using these words of power, uh, which we call Heka in the or Hekala or Kukala in the ancient Egyptian language, you know, which is magical words of power to activate you know the object in his hand and it rolls up and so you'll see it live on on that particular thing and so I, I mentioned earlier this concept of Odu Ifa and so the divination system of Ifa we mark the the divination um, or the codes so to speak the Odu's by these particular lines